Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. Welcome to Interstitial Lung Disease Info. In the episode today, I'd like to discuss about cardiovascular disease in interstitial lung diseases and how this is really something that we should be looking out for, especially when we are dealing with patients who are a little bit older. And generally, that's the patient population that has interstitial lung diseases. Now, when we talk about interstitial lung diseases, there are many conditions. Some may have a known cause, some may not have a known cause. So when we talk about things like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, idiopathic NSIP, we're talking about conditions in which there can be lung scarring that can be worsening over time, but without a known trigger, a known cause that we can find. And then we have the known causes. And sometimes we talk about interstitial lung diseases in which we have, for example, rheumatological diseases, and we call these connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung diseases. A mouthful, of course, but it just goes to show that there is a diverse group of conditions that sometimes may have causes that can be sometimes linked with uh, develop the development of cardiovascular disease, depending on how these conditions behave. But I wanted to just make this video because I think in in my practice and things that I can see from the clinic, I've noticed that there are a lot of patients who present without a lot of cardiac investigations, and sometimes they may be diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, and this seems to be an end-all. Uh, the breathlessness is then put down to the fact that they have lung scarring, pulmonary fibrosis, and then we tend to forget about the fact that between the lungs there is a heart that may not be functioning optimally in these patients. So there are a couple of things that I'd like to bring up. One is pulmonary hypertension, and I'll explain what this means in a second. I'll talk a little bit about the fact that um, patients with ILD may be more prone to having heart attacks or strokes. Uh, there's also the issue about heart failure, blood clots, and the need to do echocardiograms or screening for actually looking at the heart with an ultrasound scan just to see if it's working properly, and maybe doing other investigations as well. So let's uh, start off by saying that pulmonary hypertension is increased pressure between the right side of the heart and the lungs. There is an artery that connects the right side of the heart to the lungs, and that's called the pulmonary artery. When we have increased pressure in that system on the right side of the heart, where usually the pressures are low, we have a problem in the circulation of blood through the lungs, and that can lead to very low blood oxygen levels, especially on exertion. Now, patients who have interstitial lung diseases are at a high risk of developing right side, right heart uh, disease. So that's because there is usually either severe disease in the lung tissue. So, for example, a lot of the drug, uh, a lot of the lung may be scarred. And there may be scar tissue there that may be um, distorting the lung parenchyma. There may be destruction in the lung tissue, and that may lead to a lower um, amount of space through which the blood can flow. So that can obviously lead to pulmonary hypertension or increased pressures on the right side of the heart on that system and that can can mean that the blood as it passes through the lungs cannot pick up as much oxygen as it would and that's especially relevant when people with interstitial lung diseases try to do any form of exercise and in some cases it can be that severe that even you know just walking around the house doing basic chores may lead to very low oxygen levels very high levels of breathlessness and that can be in all interstitial lung diseases when they become severe probably there will there will be an impact on the right side of the heart now, sometimes in certain interstitial lung diseases, we may have a disproportionate amount of pulmonary hypertension compared to the amount of lung damage. So there may be, especially in situations when we have either sarcoidosis or connective tissue diseases, so inflammatory conditions that may affect different organs of the body, we may have situations in which the pressure in the right side of the heart going into the lungs is increased much more than we would expect just looking at the lungs. The lungs look a little bit affected, so we have a diagnosis of an interstitial lung disease, but maybe there's only maybe 5% damage, 10% damage to the lungs, and then the rest of the lungs are fine. But still, that particular patient may have very high um, values on their uh, estimated pulmonary pressures, so on the right side of the heart. And that can cause a lot of breathing difficulties, impairment, and sometimes these patients really struggle because they're not getting the appropriate care because everyone puts their breathlessness down to the lung disease, but sometimes it cannot be explained. So this highlights the need to always have an interdisciplinary approach to work together with the cardiologists, with internal medicine specialists, with the pulmonologists, to all work together to try to have an optimal treatment for each particular case. And there are maybe other tests that may need to be done. So for example, doing a right side um, catheterism of the heart to actually measure the pressure, to see whether 
there would be therapies that could be helpful depending on the type of pulmonary hypertension is there. But pulmonary hypertension is a very, very important thing to screen out for, uh, to screen for in patients who suffer with interstitial lung diseases. And I cannot stress that enough. I think we're not doing enough tests sometimes for the heart uh, because we tend to focus on the lung problem and we forget that there, there should be a holistic approach. But that's something that I wanted to mention. And also there's another complication here when we talk about pulmonary hypertension, the fact that it can lead to low levels of oxygen and low levels of oxygen in themselves can worsen the pulmonary hypertension due to a reflex that the body has to constrict the vessels when there's not enough oxygen going in that area of the lung. So that is something that can be treated with supplementary oxygen or extra oxygen. And I know psychologically it can be really tricky to go on oxygen therapy, but actually if we use oxygen on exertion, if it is indicated to us, so if the blood levels go down, the oxygen blood levels go down and we are on extra oxygen when we need it, not necessarily for breathlessness, we tend to reduce the pulmonary pressures on the right side of the heart in that system in that vascular system between the right side of the heart and the lungs and that can actually reduce the breathlessness keep the oxygen levels more steady in the blood and which can prevent complications in the long run so actually going on extra oxygen if it is indicated as uh, and i repeat that if the blood levels are low and if your doctor recommends going on oxygen i know psychologically it can be difficult but it is actually a form of treatment so that can work to alleviate some of these uh, issues related to pulmonary hypertension. So that's one thing that I wanted to discuss. The echocardiogram is something that I would like to encourage uh, people to, to have done, especially if they have um, interstitial lung diseases. Not, not everyone needs an echocardiogram and ultrasound scan of the heart, but I think it's a very useful test to have because it, first of all, screens for pulmonary hypertension, and we've, I've discussed this at length just now, uh, but also it can find uh, potential evidence that there is also left-sided heart failure so the the heart has two basic systems there's the right side that is the left side and they all work together the, the heart is a complicated organ it has four chambers the two of them are actually pumping the blood into the rest of the body and two of them are receiving the blood from the rest of the body but they there are two systems which are running in a sequence so basically the blood that comes back from the body goes into the right side of the heart is then pumped through the lungs to collect oxygen it returns to the left side of the heart and then it is pumped into the rest of the body so the left side is stronger it needs to push the blood very far into you know your fingers your legs etc but it needs to pass through the the lungs first and then go into the rest of the body but in some instances the left side of the heart can become insufficient so there can be heart failure we call that heart failure it's not the best term to use because it may imply as a terminal it's a terminal situation but it can uh, be a situation in which the heart is struggling to cope with the demands of the body there are a lot of treatments for that so fortunately even though for interstitial lung disease we do not have so many treatments available for cardiac disease. There have been a lot of developments. There are a lot of th therapies that can be used to optimize how the blood flows through the body. And I think a collaboration with an internal medicine special specialist or cardiologist will help a lot in cases where interstitial lung disease patients are struggling with cardiovascular disease. But sometimes we need to do this ultrasound scan of the heart, this echocardiogram to actually figure out whether there's a problem with the heart or not. So this is one test that's really important to do, I think. And I think, in my opinion, all patients who are diagnosed with interstitial lung disease should at some point have an echocardiogram done. And this test has become very available in most parts of the world. In some places, there may be a long waiting list. And I'm talking about the UK system here, in which I work. There can be a fairly long waiting list to get this test done. But I think it's important to have it done at least every now and then, or at least once, just to make sure that there isn't any other problem to look out for. So that's one thing. The other thing would be to talk about uh, heart attacks and strokes. And actually, it's been found that the... Um, levels of prevalence of coronary artery disease so coronaries the coronaries being the arteries that feed the heart so there are these little arteries that go around the heart and they feed the actual muscle that pumps the blood because even that muscle needs oxygen and nutrients to work so when these arteries become narrowed we call that coronary artery disease and that can be, can be due to uh, atherosclerosis plaque deposition high levels of cholesterol, things like that, that may lead to cardiovascular disease. So coronary artery disease in particular makes people more prone to getting heart attacks. And it's been found in several studies that actually in patients who have respiratory disease, patients who have interstitial lung diseases 
have a higher prevalence of coronary artery disease than those who have other conditions such as COPD or asthma. So this is again a reflection of maybe a different disease process related to the interstitial lung disease or it could also be the fact that patients who have interstitial lung diseases are generally older than patients who develop COPD or asthma. So that again may mean that they may collect a lot more other problems, other health issues, comorbidities throughout their life, and these need to be addressed individually as well with the appropriate treatments. So if there is a need for treatment for cardiovascular disease, that may be required. Sometimes a procedure may be required to put a stent to open up the artery to make sure that the blood is flowing and the heart is operating optimally. So again, collaboration with a cardiology specialist is really important in patients who have pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease just to make sure that the heart is treated pro uh, appropriately because it's one of the main culprits sometimes for breathlessness worsening in patients who have interstitial lung disease that is not yet well managed. And the other final thing I wanted to mention is about blood clots. So blood clots can happen in anyone pretty much, but I think patients who have interstitial lung disease and who are moving less and less, they spend more time at home, especially in severe cases, there may be a higher risk of developing blood clots. Usually these happen in the peripheral veins of the body, so generally in the legs or pelvis. And then one of these blood clots can actually detach and move into the lungs, and we call that a pulmonary embolism. When this happens, there is an obstruction in the blood flow through a certain area of the lung, which means that less oxygen can be uh, absorbed by the body because there's some of the, uh, some of the vasculature in the lung is blocked by that clot, Blood can't get through, it cannot collect the oxygen to go into the rest of the body. So again, this can lead to problems with breathlessness that, you know, can occur. So these blood clots may be hard to diagnose sometimes, may be hard to pick up, but I think it's important for patients who have interstitial lung disease, especially if they suddenly become more breathless, sort of, all of a sudden they become more breathless without a known explanation, nothing else happened, there's no chest infection, there's no chest pain, there's nothing else, but suddenly they become more breathless or maybe they have other associated symptoms such as, for example, one leg becoming more swollen than the other leg and red and tender. This is a sign that there may be deep vein thrombosis or a clot developing in the veins of the legs and potentially a little clot can de detach from there and go into the lung. Uh, vasculature and the blood, blood vessels in the lungs and that can again be uh, a pulmonary embolism and this can lead to more breathlessness. So this is something to be aware of. It's not something that we need to always be looking out for that there is some kind of cardiovascular disease happening but I think it's really important to think about the blood vessels feeding the lungs, feeding the heart because if these systems are not operating optimally even if we are trying our best to treat the interstitial lung disease with all kinds of conditions, with all kinds of medications, anti-scarring medication, anti-fibrotic medication, or potentially um, immunosuppressant medication, corticosteroids, prednisolone, things like that to treat maybe a connective tissue disease, it may not be enough to just give you these treatments. We may need to work together with other specialists, not necessarily related to the heart, but mainly the heart, because we are talking about a patient group that's at risk of developing heart disease. So. Collaboration is key and a holistic approach to patient care is really, really important. So that's what I wanted to highlight in this episode, just to be on the lookout for cardiovascular disease in patients who have interstitial lung disease. It's really important to look out for it and treat it well and appropriately for optimal outcomes. Hopefully this was helpful. If you have further questions, do leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you in future videos. All the best.